All right, so we're starting by bringing back this idea of turning improper fractions like these into mixed numbers because last week we did some multiplying and dividing and we ended up getting big numbers when we did those. And all of a sudden those threw us off. So I'm bringing us back here so we can see how to deal with the big numbers as well. But we start with hopefully what's easier numbers. Remember how we approach these? We start by saying how many times does 5 go into 23? <laughs> And it's how many whole times it goes in. Well, I know 5 times 4 gets me up to 20. So it goes in 4 times. That's the closest I can get to 23 without going over, which is what we want. <laughs> but then, if 4 times 5 is 20, that means I have 3 left over. So it's 4 and 3 fifths. There's your mixed number. Final answer, 4 and 3 fifths. We're going to use the same method for this problem. And again, remember, when we did that multiplying and dividing, we got some really big numbers. So we're thinking, how do we deal with those big numbers? All right, so first thing I need to do is I need to figure out how many times does 3 go into 512. This, strangely enough, does not come up in the multiplication table that you have memorized. <laughs> and so how can we do it then? Well... You can go ahead and break out the calculator and use the calculator for doing this. What is 512 know, divided four. by 3? Oh, All right. And so when we do that calculation, it tells us 170.6 repeating. Uh, but all I care about here, all I care about is that whole number. I only care about the 170 because it tells me that it went in 170 whole times. So now I'm going to end up with 170 and something thirds. Okay, so now we need to know what's left over. And if you want to know what is left over, then you're going to do 3 times 170. And when we do that in our calculator, again, we got to use calculator here just because these are really big numbers. We get 510. So how many are left over in order to get to the 512? Two. So that's how we know it's 170 and 2 thirds. Now in this case, the big number is more the denominator. And actually this one isn't too bad because of the numbers that are involved. But again, if we can do it with these numbers, we're going to be able to do it with other numbers that are going to be coming up here. And, but the process is still the same. I still need to figure out how many times does 48 go into 100? And in this case... Yeah, you could use your calculator, but I know many of you are able to just look at it and know. If you did it in your calculator, it would tell you two point something. If you did it in your head, you know it goes in two times. So our whole number is two. It's going to be two and something over 48. Well, what is two times Four. 48? That gives us 96. That means here that this two right here, actually represents 96 48. Okay, so how many are left over to get up to the 100? There's four left to get up to the 100 then. So it's two and four 48. Although, yeah, notice four and 48, that's reducible. So let's go ahead and reduce that because we always need to reduce it here. And so... The 2 stays the same. Remember, reducing doesn't ever change the whole number. It only affects the fraction. So what can I divide both 4 and 48 by? 2. I can divide them both by 2. Four. Four I can four. also divide them both by 4. Since I see both of those, I'm going to go with the bigger number. I'm going to divide by 4. So 4 divided by 4 is 1. And 48 divided by 4 is 12. So we get a final answer of 2 and 1 twelfth. All right, now for this problem. Notice now we're dealing with the sorts where we end up with big numbers on top and bottom. This is often what we come up with when we do multiplying or dividing with mixed numbers. We end up stuff that looks like this. So, let's go ahead and approach it. First thing we got to do, how many times does 35 go into 472? You probably don't know that off the top of your head. So, I divide them. I'm going to go ahead and do 472 divided by 35. When you do that, you should be getting an answer of 
13 point something. I don't care what the something is. That something doesn't tell me anything here. All I care about is that it goes in 13 whole times so that I can know that the whole number out front has got to be a 13. So it's going to be 13 and something over 35. Now I've got to figure out what the something is. That's so if I do the 35 times the 13, what's that give me? That should give us 455. Okay, so that means that this 13 that I found earlier represents 455 of the 472. Okay, so then how many are left over? Well, I'm going to have to do the 472 minus that 455. That will tell me then how many is left over. Notice this is exactly the same stuff that you did in your head earlier. Just now we're having to actually probably break out the calculator for some of these because the numbers are just a little bit tougher to work with. But still the same thing. So if I do that subtraction, it gives me an answer of 17. So it tells me that when I went in 13 whole times, I, that I had 17 left over. And so the 17 goes on top. Can I reduce 17 35ths? No. Because 17 is a prime number. So we're done. All right, so now we're multiplying mixed numbers. Step one, turn both of them into an improper fraction. So I'm going to do 7 times 2, which is 14, plus the 4 on the top. That gives me 18 over 7. I'm then going to multiply that by the 3 and 2 thirds turned into a mixed number or improper fraction as well. So I do 3 times 3, which is 9, plus the 2 on the top. That gives me 11 over 3. Now we can go ahead and multiply those. And remember to multiply fractions. Multiply straight across the top and multiply straight across the bottom. And when you do that, you get 198 over 21. But we're not done here because we were given our original problem as mixed numbers. Therefore, I want to give my answer as a mixed number as well. So now using the stuff that we were just talking about at the start of class here, turn this now into a mixed number. All right. So now this whole problem is just boiled down to this, where all we're doing is turning this problem now into a mixed number. So I first say, okay, how many times does 20 go, 21 go into 198? And if we do the division on our calculator, or if we figure it out by other means, it goes in nine times. Okay? Now, I need to know how many are left over. So I figure out, okay, well, if I have nine holes, and each of those is 21, then the, like the nine times 21 would tell me how many are represented by that. So this really represents right here, 189 of the 198. And again, I got that by doing 9 times 21. And so, if that's 189 right there, and I want to get up to 198, how much further was left? 9. 9. Because 198 minus 189. It's just a matter of saying, from here to here, how many were left? Okay, now that I know that, well, I've turned it into a mixed number, which normally would mean I'm done, but in this case I'm afraid it doesn't because you'll notice that our fraction reduces. What can I divide top and bottom of my fraction by? Three. Three. And so, nine divided by three is three. Twenty-one divided by three is seven. Final answer is nine and three sevens. If you can do that one, you're going to be able to deal with any of the other ones that you see like it. And write it down, of course, as an example, so that should you forget along the way, you'll be able to look back at it. All right, and now we shift back into graphing. And the first thing that we're going to be graphing is this equation. But now that we've seen the different types of graphs, I now get to introduce one last piece to these types of equations. 
and that is that I've given you all of the equations so far nice and pretty with x and there is our variable which you're still going to see but it's not the only thing you see when graphing sine and cosine oftentimes we see this character pop up because this is typically used to represent angles and since sine and cosine deals with angles this comes up that symbol right there looks like a zero with a horizontal line through it that is actually a Greek letter because mathematicians still love Greek letters for whatever reason they still do that particular symbol is actually theta. And so when you see that pop up in the equation, that's actually how we read it. We read that as theta. And yes, it's a Greek letter, but we use it like any other variable. So it doesn't actually change what we do in our work. We treat it just like we did use x or anything else I might plug in there. It's just I want to now start getting you used to seeing it there because, yes, it's going to be popping up in other work that you see along the way, and I don't want to shock you when it does then. And so when I'm looking at this equation now, I'm seeing that I'm doing 3 cosine of theta plus 1, which, of course, is the same as when I did 3 times cosine of x plus 1. And so when graphing this, I'm going to start by graphing the very first thing I did when graphing yesterday, which isn't any points, but rather the midline. The midline, remember, is whatever number is being added or subtracted on the end of our equation. In this case, it's plus 1. So that means I want to start this problem by drawing in a dotted line up at y equals 1. Do so on your graph. And then once we've drawn in the midline, then we need to draw in the top and bottom lines. Now, how far up should I go from my midline to get to the top? It's 3, yes. Uh, that amount that we have to go up from the midline or down from the midline. Do you remember what we call that? What we call that distance? It was in our notes from yesterday, which is why I'm asking. Oh, uh, 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 we've forgotten already. Honestly, I don't even know what I know. I know. It's the midline. One. The what? The amp. Oh, yeah. Amplitude. Yes. The amplitude tells me that I'm going to have to go up three and down three from the midline. So go ahead and do that. All right, next up. I now need to actually start plotting a point. So that means I need to know where does cosine start, because I notice that this is a cosine graph. Where does cosine start? The top, the middle, or the bottom? Middle. Cosine, I can answer that. Cosine top. starts at the top. We literally said it started in the middle. And so since cosine starts at the top, I go ahead and put my first point there at the top. Notice that's on the axis because it wasn't moved over at all or anything like that. And then once I know that point, I know where all the rest of the points should be because I know my pattern. Top, middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top. So go ahead and draw in the rest of those points. All right, now this problem, when we're going to take a look at this graph, we're going to go ahead and be able to graph it using all the same methods. What makes this one a little bit trickier than some of the others is this one now involves three transformations instead of just one or two. All right, now in order to kind of keep things straight, I do want to start by thinking about, okay, where's the midline? What's the amplitude? And kind of really being explicit with some of that stuff. So first of all, the midline. What's the midline for this one? It's right. Yep. It's always whatever is added or subtracted onto the end. So it is negative one. Technically, y equals negative one. So since I know that it's y equals negative one, start please by drawing that line on your graph. Draw it as dotted, but draw on the midline, please. 
All right, so when you draw in the midline, this is what you should have just drawn, a horizontal dotted line at negative 1. Now from there, we need to know what's the amplitude. So the amplitude is the 3. Because remember, the amplitude is always whatever number is multiplied out front. Okay? So now that we know the amplitude is 3, draw in the top line and the bottom line. And so when we draw in those lines, notice each of those lines, three up from the midline and three down from the midline. That's what the amplitude is really meaning, is it's saying from that middle, I'm going to have to go up three and I'm going to have to go down three. Now that I have those guidelines drawn in, I can worry about where I put the first point. But the first point on this one can be a little bit trickier if we aren't careful. Because we have two things that tell us where the first point goes. First of all, this is a sine graph. Where does sine start? The top, the middle, or the bottom? Middle. This is what we learned yesterday? Yes, it is middle. So I know that sine is going to start on the midline. But it's not going to be here. Why? Because there's one more piece that we didn't use out of this equation, that plus 270. That plus 270 tells me to move it left, 270. And so then this is where we put our first point, because it's going to be on the midline, but left at 270. So I go over to a negative 270 for that first point. So where do we go from here then? I just plotted a point in the middle. Do I go up or down from here? It's sine, so that actually tells me. Because sine starts in the middle and then goes up. So I go over 90 degrees like I always do. And this time I put the point on the top line. Now that I've seen that, I now know where I am in the pattern, and so I can go ahead and plot the rest of the points. So do so. Plot the rest of the points now.